for our next speaker. It's Megan Sustek from uh, the University of Florida. She's from Barry's lab, and they have also worked on the mouse model and have equally exciting results. Megan? Thank you. So I first want to start by going over um, the outline of my presentation. So I will begin by going over some of the TAS knockdown mouse model data that we had published previously, just to kind of catch you up to speed about where we're going and why we're going in that direction. And then I'll talk about the endurance training that we did with the mouse model, and then um, and talk about the protocol that we used and some of the results that we obtained from this protocol. And then I'm going to switch gears and kind of talk about the gene therapy aspect. So I know many of you are familiar with Barry Burns' work in Pompe disease, and I know a lot of people have been asking, when's the gene therapy coming? So that's where we're kind of shifting over to now. So I'll go over some background information about gene therapy, um, show you some pre very uh, little preliminary data on that, and talk about some of our future directions. Um, and then I'll just summarize all of this up at the end. All right, so Colin kind of went over the TAS knockdown model that's being used. So importantly, I'm just going to say that it is a knockdown model, not, not a knockout model. Um, so we do see residual TAS activity there. Um, as he kind of said also, uh, our group has been using the doxycycline that's in the chow, and we've been using it at much lower levels, at about 200 mg per kg. Um, this has been the data that we previously published using real-time PCR to show that we're able to obtain uh, different levels and um, about 90% knockdown in the heart and about 95% knockdown in skeletal muscle using this protocol. So when we look at uh, the cardiac aspects of um, the results of these knockdowns, uh, we see that if we looked at 10 months of age, this is the first point that we're really seeing cardi cardiomyopathy in this mouse model. At three months of age, although we're seeing an increase in left ventricular mass, we're not seeing any difference, any significant difference in the injection fraction. So of course, if we're going to be doing gene therapy, which has always been Barry's ultimate goal here, um, we need something to measure. And fortunately, in this mouse model, um, we do see abnormal cardiolipin levels and as a result of the knockdown. And we also see differences in electron microscopy. However, we wanted to see if we can actually accelerate the cardiomyopathy that we see much later. And to do this, we decided to try an endurance training protocol. Um, so the protocol that we used has actually been shown to be good for using physiological um, as a physiological stressor, but in animal models that there is an underlining heart failure, this protocol has also been shown to essentially cause heart failure, to accelerate the heart failure. So that's exactly what we were doing. So we swam male mice uh, five times per week, twice a day, for a total of 35 days. And this is what we consider a RAM protocol, in which on the very first day we swam the mice for 10 minutes in the morning. Oops. Oops. That's okay. So 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon. The following day, we boosted it up to 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, and so on and so forth until we got to 90 minutes. So day 9 through day 35, the mice swam twice a day, 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes in the afternoon. So this was a pretty intense protocol for the mice. You can go ahead and... So I'm showing you the video for a reason, besides of entertainment value. Um, <laughs> so I get asked a lot of questions about, well, how do you know the mice were actually swimming the whole time? And, <laughs> and you can see here that they are swimming. And we actually swim them in a rat cage. So this is a rat cage. Um, we do keep track of the temperature the entire time, so we we're able to monitor that. But importantly here, um, mice will float. So mice will actually turn on their sides and float when they get tired. And so the beauty in throwing all of the mice in at once, besides it makes my life a little bit easier, at the same time is they will start climbing on top of each other. And there's portions where you can actually see the mice dunking the other mice, forcing them to swim back up. So it is a pretty intensive, um, life-threatening, so to speak, protocol. So we examined the cardiac function um, after uh, the 35 days of swimming the mice. And we did this with uh, MRI. And so we started off by looking at the left ventricular mass. And these groups here are the sedentary controls. And then these groups here are the um, 
groups that underwent the endurance training. So if you look here, you can see that going from the con control sedentary group over to the control endurance train group, the left ventricular mass went up about 22%. Um, likewise, in the TAS knockdown group, it went up about 13%. And so this is actually... Um, so this is actually exactly what we would expect from an endurance training protocol. Um, if you look here, you can actually see that this is very significant compared to the TAS knockdown endurance train group. So there was a significant increase in the TAS knockdown sedentary heart um, compared to the TAS knockdown group that underwent the endurance training. When we look at the ejection fraction here, um, I want to focus on the TAS knockdown group that was sedentary and the TAS knockdown group that underwent the protocol because you can see here that this is actually a significant increase. So we started off with a severe depletion, a little bit of a depletion compared to the controls, not significant, however. And you can see here that here, once again, this data is not significantly different between the TAS knockdown endurance trained animal and the control endurance trained. Um, but this is very significant between the two uh, TAS knockdown um, groups. We then looked at cardiac morphology, and so we did this by electron microscopy. So the top figure here is the control animal that underwent the endurance training, and then the TAS knockdown endurance trained animal here. And you can see we're seeing something very similar to what Colin just uh, was like, talking about too, where we get these like clusters of mitochondria in the endurance trained animals, and they seem to actually be kind of pushing the myofibers out of the way. So there's definitely abnormal um, morphology here with the, car with the uh, mitochondria as long as uh, also with the myofibers. So based on the EM, we wanted to see if maybe there was an upregulation of mitochondrial biosynthesis. And to do this, um, we used real-time PCR to look at PGC1-alpha mRNA levels. And in doing so, we saw that there wasn't actually a significant difference between the two, the two groups that were endurance trained. And then we also wanted, said to ourselves, well, maybe we're just not waiting long enough. Maybe there's some differences on the molecular scale. So we looked at BNP according to real-time PCR. And although there seems to be a trend where BNP um, looks like it may be upregulated in the TAS knockdown group compared to the control group that underwent the endurance training protocol, um, these values are not significant. So the next thing we wanted to do was actually assess the mitochondria. And using uh, 11 Tesla um, ma magnet that you see here, we can use P31 as a non-invasive in vivo measurement for looking at the different metabolites containing, containing phosphorus. So here, this is an example spectra. And you can see here, we have our ATP group, our phosphocreatine group, and then our inorganic phosphate. And so this is just a representation of if we take a tissue and we put it in the magnet and just looked at that one moment, what the, what the metabolites are doing, this is what we would see. Now we can also look at these metabolites over time, and we can actually make several measurements and create what we call a stack plot of P31 spectra. And so we can do this over time with, for example, adding um, exercise in or electrical simulation in with some of these protocols. So we know that phosphocreatine can be utilized as a high energy source during times of, for example, exercise. Um, so at the same time, we also know that once the muscle stops contracting, the ATP generated by the mitochondria is then used to replenish the phosphocreatine. So what we're looking at here is an example of the stack plot of P31 data in which the very beginning here, this very initial peak that you see here of uh, the PCR, all right, this is where it is during rest. And then during exercise, for example, the PCR is utilized. And then during rec a recovery period, so once you stop exercising, the PCR is able to replenish. And the same thing here. If we look at PI, PI usually starts off very low. And then, of course, during exercise, PI levels increase, and then they should come back down during recovery. And then we can take this, and we can fit this to a monoexponential curve that you see here. And this is informative, then, of the mitochondrial oxidative capacity. So that's exactly what we did with the mice. So this is actually our setup up here. Um, so because we cannot just look at a mouse and say, please exercise in the magnet for us, um, we used electrical simulation. So if you look here, these are the electrodes. 
Um, the mouse is out the entire time. We have a proton coil underneath, the P31 coil on top, and then this is the mouse's uh, gastro gastrocinemias. And so for signal sake, we shave the leg. And so you can see here that we begin by just acquiring spectra at rest, and then we um, electrically stimulate the, the sciatic nerve, which is going to contract the gastrocinemias for five minutes, and then we allow the PCR levels to recover. So as you can see here between the control group and the TAS knockdown group, it appears that, if you look here, here's the actual values, that the recovery rate in the TAS knockdown group that was endurance trained is much slower than the recovery period for the PCR levels for the control group, as shown here. Um, and this value is not dependent on the overall PCR depletion, but it is dependent on, obviously, pH. So that's shown here. So obviously, you can see that at, P at rest, the pH values are very similar between the two groups. And then post-electrical um, stimulation, you see that there is some difference, which may suggest that there, there could be some buffering capacity that is different between the two, the two groups. So to conclude, um, the endurance exercise training is not sufficient to accelerate cardiac uh, dysfunction in young TAS knockdown animals, and endurance training may be beneficial in TAS knockdown mice in regards to heart function. However, TAS knockdown mice demonstrate a reduction in oxidative capacity. So this is going to bring me on to the next section of my talk, which is the gene therapy aspect. And so I'm not quite sure how familiar everyone here is with gene therapy, so I'm going to give you a quick background. Um, so of course, first of all, you start off with a target cell. So you have a cell that has some kind or some form of mutation, as seen here by the sad face. And so what the strategy for this is, is that you have your corrected version of the gene. And for my talk, I will be specifically referring to um, AAV when I talk about gene therapy. But of course, there are many different systems that are used for, for gene therapy and gene delivery. Um, so your gene is then packaged into an adeno-associated viral capsid, and then you administer according to, you pick a route that really will target the, the target cells that you would like. So um, here, this is showing AAV delivery, and then AAV will have to enter the cell and obviously get into the nucleus. And from there, the cell will begin to express a correct copy of the gene. So this slide, I know you can't see it all, but this slide is mainly here to show you that this is just current AV trials that are ongoing. And if you look at the top over here, the top side is inherited diseases, so gene therapy use, being used for inherited diseases. And then the bottom over here is AV clinical trials for acquired diseases. So I just want to pick out a couple very quickly. So the first is the Leber's congenital amaurosis, with the RPE gene. And this is a disease, if you're not familiar with, which results in a loss of vision very early on in these patients. And the clinical trial that's going on now, they do a subretinal injection with an AV virus containing a correct version of the RPE gene. And what they actually have been able to see in this trial is that these people are able to regain their vision. So they, everyone who was... Um, who was in this trial began with, with no vision and actually were able to see correction of vision here. Um, Pompe disease, so obviously this is one of Barry's favorites. Um, so Barry, right currently, is doing a gene therapy trial for Pompe disease in which he's injecting patients in the diaphragm. So Pompe disease um, not only has a cardiac function, also has a respiratory function to it. Uh, most of these patients who are injected are on uh, ventilator support, and these patients are still after the gene therapy on ventilator support right now. However, um, if, you, if you can imagine, these, these kids who are, on, um, who are on these ventilators, in order to go from downstairs in their house to upstairs, they need to have one parent carry the child, the other parent carry the ventilator. Um, some of the patients in this trial are now saying that they're able to unplug the ventilator, carry the child upstairs, come back down, carry the ventilator. So, I mean, it's a little thing, but at the same time, you can imagine as a parent, if every time you needed to take your kid from the downstairs to the upstairs, having to have two of you to do it. That's, that's a big deal. And then I'm not really going to go into detail with the circa trial, but um, this is just mainly pointing out that 
Um, it's also being used for acquired diseases. Um, in the CIRCA trial, what they're seeing is with, a, with severe heart failure that some of these patients are having lower incidences of, of cardiac um, inc incidences. So. So why do we use AAV? So N-associated virus is small. It's about 20 nanometers. It's non-pathogenic. It has the ability to transduce both dividing and non-dividing cells. Um, it's long-term stable gene transfer. So there are primate studies that have been done where we express AAV, and we can actually see, I think the longest published study shows that 27 months, so you inject a primate, 27 months later, we're still getting stable gene expression. Um, and importantly, very importantly, this is done without disrupting genes by insertional mutagenesis. So it is not a retrovirus. It, it does not integrate the same way. So I'm going to focus now on talking just a little bit about optimization for gene therapy. So a lot goes in into trying to decide what kind of construct you should be using and, of course, how this will actually be delivered and expressed. And so, first of all, um, it's very important to pick a serotype that is specific for what you're actually trying to transduce. So, for example here, um, there are very d many different capsids that you can choose. So AAV comes in many different flavors. And what I mean by that is that the capsid, the sequence is slightly different amongst the capsids, and this allows for preferential tropism of different tissues. So for example, you see here, um, we're looking at expression in the heart, and you can see here, for example, that AAV9 shows a much higher um, level of expression in the heart than AAV2. So in targeting, for example, like we would want to for Barth syndrome, um, we would be focusing on using an AV such as AV9 um, that has preferential tropism for the heart. And then also picking your promoter. Um, so previous studies, many of the early studies that have been done in gene therapy have focused on using the CMV promoter, which is a viral promoter. So you get very high levels of expression everywhere as you can see here, by everything lighting up. Um, this doesn't give us much regulation when it comes to gene therapy. So what we really want to focus on, especially if we're going to start, for example, like Barth syndrome, wanting to focus mainly on skeletal muscle and heart, is using more of a specific promoter. Um, and here, this is the cardiac troponin T promoter, in which you can see that now you're getting tissue-restricted expression of your gene, and this is just mostly in the heart, as opposed to what we previously have used in gene therapy, where we're getting expression everywhere. Okay. So this brings me to the preliminary data that, we, that we're, I'm going to be presenting here. And so the constructs that we want to use, we are taking all this into consideration. And so I'm going to start by talking about promoter selection for us. And so what we want to do is actually compare two different promoters. Um, the first one is the Desmond promoter, which is a um, muscle-restricted promoter. And then the second one that I'm actually going to be showing you some data for, too, is the trying to find the human to phasin promoter. And so we received the sequence, I think from Iris Gonzalez, and looking at the sequence, we cloned a region upstream of the to phasin start site, and we placed that in front of um, a luciferase reporter. And basically we wanted to see if, if upstream we can find a promoter sequence. And so we took these constructs and we transfected um, C2, C12 cells, which are mouse skeletal muscle cells. And if you look here, this is just 48 hours post-transfection. These are a very difficult cell line to actually transfect. Um, so I'm just showing you here that we're able to transfect them. And this is the luciferase activity. So you have the relative luciferase expression here and then the different promoters that we use. So GFP, um, this had no luciferase in it at all. So obviously it's low levels of luciferase activity. Um, PGL3 is the luciferase uh, construct with no promoter in front of it. So we should see just background here. And then the sequence that we took that we believed may contain the human TAS promoter, um, we placed that in front of luciferase, and you can see here that we got activity. And then we compared this to the Desmond promoter, which was the muscle-restricted promoter. And as you can see here, we see about three times higher uh, fold expression. So this kind of gave us hope of, okay, well, maybe if we use this endogenous human to phasin promoter, we can actually get the right levels of expression and hopefully get gene correction. So this brings me to the future direction. So what we're doing now is we've actually created these constructs in which 
Um, this is similar to what you saw in the last slide, except now we're replacing luciferase with the tofazin cDNA. And we're putting this cDNA in front of both the Desmond and the TAS promoter. And this is already being packaged into AAV9. And hopefully, we'll be delivering this construct to our mice very soon. And then, of course, test the efficacy of the construct in vivo by looking at protein expression and also by looking at the lipid profiles. So just to kind of summarize all this up and pull it together, um, endurance training does not accelerate the cardiomyopathy in the mouse, and it may be beneficial, as you saw in the um, ejection fraction data. And then gene therapy is a successful therapeutic approach in treating disease, and the endogenous promoter, along with the preferential tropism of AV9 for the heart, will result in appropriate levels of gene expression. I know that's a strong statement. And finally, I would like to just say thank you to my mentor who cannot be here. He should be maybe on, close to being on top of Kilimanjaro. And my co-mentor, Al Lewin, who ironically is not on top of Kilimanjaro but is in Africa. And then the rest of the Burn Lab and the Vector Core at UF. Um, and then our outside collaborators, um, Michael Schlame and the Barth Syndrome Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. It was very interesting. Um, good luck to Barry. Um, so, questions? Yes. Uh, have you looked at the degree of TAS knockdown in neonatal mice? Because doxycycline is not transmitted very well through the maternal milk. Yes. So, we have not. <laughs> very, very um, pointly stated. Um, we're working on that now. Uh, we're also working on switching over our IOCUC protocol to, um, as the NYU group has said, putting it in the water instead. So we're working on that now. We just have to get IACUC approval for it. But if you depend on the mother to deliver the hemodynamics. Basically, we, we found that you need to directly inject it into the stomach of the, of the pups because the, mother, the level of dox in the mother's milk is quite low. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What is, the, what is the major problem that you need to uh, think about when it... You know, the problem that in the Pennsylvania, that really devastating Pennsylvania case of gene therapy that, that you need to avoid. So that was with adenovirus. So adenovirus is not adeno or is not um, AAV. It's, it's too different. Um, mainly, there was, a, there was a lot of compounding variables in that Pennsylvania trial. Um, but actually, with AV, we're seeing that there's a lot of different safety going on with, with changing the promoters out, with changing um, the capsids. It's really giving us an extra level of protection. Um, people are looking at the immuno aspect of AV much more carefully um, than, than we used to. Um, so people are, before people are injected, they're actually, we're actually looking for neutralizing antibodies for the different capsids. So it's it's just, very different, it's just a very different time where it's being much more regulated. So, so you're using the cDNA in, the, in gene therapy. Uh, of course, uh, there's a multiple isoforms of tafazine. We're using the full length. Full length. But, but the mouse does not have the full length. The mouse only have the delta 5. Only human has the full right. length. Right. So we're actually using, we're not using the mouse cDNA. We're using the human cDNA. But it use the full length human cDNA. But the full length. With exon 5. Mm -hmm. If we need to, we'll, we can go back and we can delete um, exon 5. But as a starting platform, we're beginning with the full length. That's actually, um, yeah, that, that is actually an important point, maybe. You should, we should talk to Barry and reconsider that. Because it's the Delta 5 form that we all agree is sort of the, the, mm -hmm. the prototype or the, the, the default form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know at this point what the, what the addition of exon 5 really does to the function of the fast. Yeah, I was wondering, um, the knockdown mouse, can you really test using this construct whether you can restore Tavazin levels? Because it's a knockdown system. So will you, with the, the, the short hairpin, uh, and also knock down the human variant of Tavazin? So I actually looked at the sequence, and I actually made um, the, the mutation, so to speak, 
keeping the amino acid sequence the same made the, made the slight mutation, so the short hairpin should not target our construct. Do you have any preliminary data for gene therapy in mice? Well, um, you didn't show anything, only your design. Specifically for the Barth syndrome? Uh-huh. No, not right now. We're getting, as I said, we're in the middle of getting these uh, constructs packaged. So hopefully in the next month we'll be injecting. Uh, this is first question. Maybe after you got some phenotype, you couldn't give explanation because you don't have really mouse type gene. Mouse type gene, mouse genome doesn't have exome 5. Right, which is what um, yeah. Dong was This saying. is the first thing. Second is, you know, your first experiment, I do... Adurance, uh, adurance, right? Test, right? Just swimming, swimming, right? You know, before you do swimming test, you have to check the protein level of type gene. If they are not, you know, induced very well, you couldn't get any good results. Right. Well, currently we don't, in our hands, we don't have an antibody for tefazin. Looks like they are normal. The mice? Because, yeah, because oh, yeah. the mice really have, you know, pathological phenotype, they don't move so good like that. Yeah, so Even have to, they still just like Well, my, mice are endogenous swimmers, so if you do obviously throw them in the water, wild-type mice will swim just fine. Um, and apparently, the Taz mice will swim because just fine Because this as well. is, you, 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 I don't know, this is control, this is a bath induced, right? Mm -hmm. But if this is a bath induced, they are so good. In general, they are not good like that. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Um, so you, you showed uh, some expression with a region of the TAS promoter. Have you done much examination of adding of promoter bashing to see how, if that level of expression can be increased with more? Right. No, we have not done that yet. Um, with that, we're... Because with AAV, our capacity for um, cloning into this construct, so uh, AAV, we can't clone much bigger than about 4.9, 4.8, somewhere in there. Um, because TAS is so small, we're able to fit much more of the upstream region in. So for the sake of gene therapy, we're actually able to fit, um, this was a 1 kb region, so we are actually able to take that whole 1 kb and add it and it will package just fine. So because of that, we have not actually broken, as you, as you would use, usually see in a typical promoter um, assay, actually break it down to see which regions are important. One last question. I was just interested in the, um, the, the, the numbers are very small and the preliminary results, but the boys that have been looked at with um, endurance training in a, a system with either um, uh, type 1 muscle more with uh, uh, endurance versus type 2 with more resistance training, mm -hmm. there may be a difference in that. I just wondered with the swim model, you have a, a little bit of both. I mean, you have some resistance in the water and you have some endurance, and I wondered if you thought about uh, trying different models of exercise uh, that may be affecting different type of muscle, uh, type 1 or type 2. Yeah, yeah. so actually we, didn't, we did not do the fiber typing, which would be one thing that would be, I think, very, um, very informative. Um, we, we did discuss doing um, a treadmill test instead, but as you said, because this is a little bit of both, we actually decided to do the swimming instead. Is there anything that would be more resistance rather than less resistance? The treadmill would be less resistance. Rest, less resistance. Would be more resistance. Um, you thicken the water or something? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how much um, the University of Florida IACUC would, would smile on us. Um, but, well, don't drown them, but yeah. a little bit more resistance. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure. I know with treadmill running too, you can you can put the incline up or down accordingly, but um, I'm I'm not quite sure. Okay, thank you, Megan. Lots to discuss, uh, and during the break, we are about 15 minutes behind, so we are having a 10-minute break, and we'll.